Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here on YouTube Live. This is another week of us talking about all things DevOps, cloud, Linux, system administration, development and containers, Kubernetes, all the buzzwords. We're basically here to talk to you about what's on our minds and to take your questions later on in the show. And we'll have a nice little two-way conversation in chat about your particular needs today in containers and DevOps. I'm excited this week because we're gonna focus on something slightly different than the typical deploying containers and running orchestration conversation. We're gonna talk about how you might go about learning more Linux stuff inside of Docker. Maybe you're not running Linux right off your machine. And with me today, we've got a special guest. I'm gonna give you that announcement in a second just to give you a little teaser because I want you to know if you're in case you're the first this is your first time watching the show, how this works. This is something I do every Thursday on the internet with almost a year now. And the, most of the people that are joining are from my courses and they're learning Docker and DevOps and Swarm and Kubernetes and all the other tooling that we're using nowadays in containers and DevOps. So click subscribe on this channel to make sure you get announcements. You're gonna need to click that little dinner bell thing and you'll see the announcements every week when I go live that way you can join and ask questions so this is sort of like a free bonus to those of you that are learning DevOps at the moment and uh, yeah and I got a newsletter and I got courses for sale and you can see all that stuff in the description on the links to my website like this one up here and away we go this week I have a special guest who is a student from my courses and we got to meet in real life in DC a couple of weeks ago and I knew I had to have him on the show. Thank you so much for being here. John Kennedy, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How about yourself? I am fine and dandy. I've got plenty of coffee in me, so I'm going to talk real fast and be excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's the best way to do it. And If only I drank coffee. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, no, that's all right. You should give it a shot. But uh, <laughs> I've also gone without coffee. I've also been a tea guy for a while. So, like, I have three different states, right? Um, and you and I met in D.C. What was it like three weeks ago? Four weeks ago? I, uh, actually, it was. It was about four yeah, weeks ago. it was four weeks. Yeah, the Docker Mid Atlantic Docker Summit. 
Yeah, and, and that's a new thing Docker's doing, right? They, uh, these summits yeah. used to be called Fed Summit, but now it's uh, regional summits to get more people uh, to basically a full day of Docker education and, and workshops for either free or $100, depending on whether you're in the public or private sectors. And so yep. you, and it, it was cool because it was when they talked orchestration, it wasn't all Kubernetes. Right. It, you know, they they actually talked about Swarm, which you don't get nearly as much as you should. Yeah, and um, I think I, I might have ranted about that for a quick second on a previous episode. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, it's great. You actually get to see, you know, more of the diverse landscape than if you were to go to a conference for a specific product. And, of course, if Docker, uh, I mean, obviously that the, the conference is Docker focused, so you're not going to hear a lot of about you know tools that docker doesn't use but um it is a little bit different take than maybe if you went to like a kubecon or something that was specifically kubernetes focused so it was kind of nice to get that diversity i think in several talks there was discussion of swarm and kubernetes at the same time so it was a uh, good healthy yeah there was there was one i think it was uh comparing the two yeah which which was pretty cool. Which is awesome. And I do all the time, and I'm glad that other people are starting to do it because uh, we we all need more than one tool in our toolbox, and yep. it's pretty great to have that. So let me give a quick introduction. Uh, in case you don't know who John, John is, he is in the Slack chat for Docker Master. You probably have seen him in there. If you've been taking the courses and you're in our Slack chat, he's been working as a Linux sysadmin for over 15 years. So like me, been around a few days. He started working with Docker about six months ago and just finished taking my course, Docker Mastery, and is soon going to take the Swarm Mastery course as well. So I'm excited to hear his feedback on that. And John lives in Northern Virginia, about five hours away from me, and is also the co-organizer of the Northern Virginia Linux User Group, which is one of the reasons I wanted to have him on the show, because that's something that's been around way longer than Docker, right? Uh, Linux user groups have been around well, since really the dawn of Linux, because it was started off as a project in the community, and so it really drew in the community. Um, so tell us a little bit about that history. Like, how did you get started with yeah. the user group and all that stuff? Well, I grew up in Northern Virginia, and um, when I first started using Linux, it was when I was had left the military, I was living in Nebraska, and I was looking for... You know, I there was an Omaha Linux user group that I joined, and I thought there had to be something in Northern Virginia. So I, I did a search online, found the Northern Virginia Linux user group, um, which has been around since 1993, I think. So, yeah, we are, we are one of the oldest Linux yeah. user groups. Um, I... And then when I moved back, I got a little more active in it. And when the organizer and founder of the group stepped down about a year and a half, two years ago, um, I couldn't just let it go away. So I, um, yeah, I had yeah. to, I had to um, step up, and another one of our members stepped up, and so we've taken over the organizing. And we have a meeting once a month. We're working on revamping the website, which is why it's not on there yet. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a lot of fun. We try to, you know, all of our talks are as basic as possible. We, you know, we're only, we meet for two hours. You can't get too in-depth in that time. Yeah. And plus, we have such a range of experience of our members and the people who show up to the meetups that we try to keep it um, as, you know, intro level basic as possible. Right. Accessible to everyone. Yeah. 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 And it, it's it's a lot of fun to do. We actually um, stream on YouTube all of our meetings as they happen. Um, and then they're also available after so if you look up, uh, there are two Nova Lug channels on YouTube, an older one and a newer one that have all of our meetings. Wow. And they're cool. And that's hard to do. I mean, uh, for the meetups that I run, like the Docker meetup, and we get requests to, you know, record them and show them on the internet and stuff. And one, that's a lot of work. <laughs> yes. Uh, or to like do it live. And two, I've always felt like, you know, nothing you learn here is new. It's all we're already on the internet. Um, and this is about community. This is about people meeting face-to-face. -face. And I think for those of you getting started in DevOps, like, 
we talked about on this show before, one of the best things you can do when you're getting started is to find other people like you in your physical area. You know, if you, if there's a meet, if you live in a city and there's a meetup near you, whether or not it's exactly um, the thing you're working on right now, maybe it's a Linux user group and you're just focused on general DevOps. Well, you're going to cross pollinate with those people. You're going to find people there that try to that are already doing what you want to do, and it, those meetings are all about people talking with other people. <laughs> um, yeah. And getting food usually, <laughs> getting free food or some sort of snacks or something. Yeah, our 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 meetings are really interactive. We, you know, when people ask me how long should I plan for my talk to be, I'll tell them about an hour and fifteen minutes of you actually presenting, and the rest of the time you'll be interacting with people, you know, asking questions, and um, yeah, it, it creates kind of that family feel. Yeah. Um, it's uh, it's something that I I believe strongly that like there there needs to be meetups and um, there you know even though we have the internet now everywhere it's in our pockets I mean meetups were around before we had that we we were all buying we we're probably sharing books at uh, back in the day like I had the you know the old Unleashed books in the nineties I think we might even have talked about that in DC the old TCPIP Unleashed and yeah. other other various books and you would they were so expensive you would share them with people and. Bar, you know, swap books, go to the library. And nowadays, with everything in your pocket, you might be tempted to think, I don't need to meet people in the real world. Well, that's not true. Because <laughs> the, the people that I've met in the real world have helped me with my career, have helped me get jobs. I mean, a lot of the jobs I've had in the last 10 years are because I knew people and they knew other people and we all got connected. And so um, it matters. It, it matters a lot. So thank you, sir, yes. for running the user group, keeping it alive. Thank you. Uh, I Thank really appreciate you. that effort, uh, even though I'm not able to attend your meetups. Uh, maybe someday when we're up in D.C., we'll, I'll get to sh show up. If you spend a weekend up here, our, our meetings are on Saturdays, which is Whoa. kind of a killer. That <laughs> yeah. is, that's, uh, yeah. that is, I don't know of anybody down here. We have lots of meetups in our area, but I don't know anyone that does it on Saturdays. So. Yeah, we do. We do Saturday from 10 till 12. So it, it, do you get kids? there's like, that kids additional show up? Um, we do get a lot of, uh, occasionally, you know, somebody will show up and they'll have their kids with them. And, um, fortunately our room's big enough and we've got internet so the kids can sit in the back and, and do whatever they want to do. Yeah. Um, we did once one guy brought his son who actually sat and participated and asked questions because dad had him into Linux. So it was, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're if you're in the chat and you're watching us now live, so John has been doing Linux forever, and I wanna I wanna you pick his brain as much as possible in the show. So if you have questions about Linux, um, he may not know all the answers off the top of his head, but we'll have a conversation about it anyway. So get those questions in the chat, and we'll answer those in a little bit. I think John and I wanted to talk a little bit uh, at first about some examples and things about. Um, you know, using and learning Linux inside of Docker. So I know, John, you kind of came up with this idea. What, what, uh, what were you thinking initially? Like, what was your experience and how this well, would play out? As you said, I've been using Docker for about six months now. So I have not had that much exposure to Alpine Linux. And as you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of Docker images and containers are built on Alpine. So there was a little bit of a learning curve. I, you know, I, I'm equally comfortable in Debian and Ubuntu as I am in Red Hat. So um, what I ended up doing is I built, I had a Docker container running Alpine. And so if ever I had a question about, you know, a command or, um, or installing packages, whatever, I had a... a an image that I could go into and use and abuse as I wanted to. Right. Um, so what I do is um, I didn't even keep the container. I, I always RM the container afterwards and I just, you know, run a new container with and bring up bash in the container and do what I needed to do. You know, pretty sound in the knowledge that there's nothing I could break that would or nothing I could do that would break my system. And it was, it was a lot of fun to learn that way because you just, um, you know, you know, you're safe. 
you can't yeah. you can't kill a system you can't break anything um the other thing w- looking at the commands you've got up um ash shell uh, the ash shell i haven't you know it's it's slightly toned down from bash and i haven't used it so I use the container to learn a little more about Ash and some of the limitations and some of the the added bonuses to it. Yeah, that's a that's a great example. I'm glad you started off with Alpine because um, I actually started using Docker when when I first started using it, I don't know 2015 something like that. Um, I was I was starting to I didn't quite get it all yet, right? I didn't quite get all the container deployments, and we weren't really talking about orchestration yet as a community as as much. Um, and so I was using it to run Ubuntu, and specifically for projects I was on where I needed to understand the differences in packages and, and files between Ubuntu 16 and 18. And I needed to run both sort of side by side. And so I would specify a version. But I, I threw this up on the screen while you were talking about it because Alpine is another variant of uh, it's a distribution of the Linux uh, sort of toolkit on top of the Linux kernel. And uh, what John's talking about here is that Alpine being so small, being 5 meg in size, uh, as a container, it doesn't come with Bash. Out of the, uh, it, you can install Bash, but it doesn't default to coming with Bash. So when you want to run it, you learn very quickly, like if you were to do Docker um, run IT Alpine Bash, it would actually give you this error. And we get a lot of students that talk about, well, what does this error mean? And, you know, all the errors make sense once you understand the error because the error was the error message was written by a person who knew what they were writing versus the rest of us <laughs> who don't understand right. what the error caused in the first place. But it's basically saying here, I can't find the bash file because it doesn't exist inside my path. So as, essentially, it, it would be a cleaner message for us to just say, this is not installed yet in your container. <laughs> right. So Alpine comes with, all of them come with SH, which is, just, which is a basic shell. And then Alpine comes with Ash, Say I guess for Alpine SH maybe I'm not sure if that's an uh, a short version of that. I I never actually got around to looking up what Ash is supposed to be. Um, try Man Ash because yeah. Man uh, yeah, yeah see and, and, the and, man and <laughs> Alpine is so thin that it doesn't have Man installed, which is uh, for looking up yeah. manuals on commands. Um, I mean I uh, so I don't know if. Uh, yeah, and and everything uh, or most things in Alpine are statically, uh, they're all built together. So they use this underpinning in the container world called BusyBox that uh, essentially causes everything to be in one large binary or in a few large binaries and allows them all to be uh, sort of aliased in a way. Uh, so you always keep seeing that BusyBox whenever you look up help or look up commands and stuff. Um, so... This is like the sort of Alpine 101, right? If you're going to jump into Alpine and learn the package manager, which is APK, which is different than um, um, like yum or apt, a- APK right. is the package manager in there. And so I'm sure like John had to discover, I had to discover, you know, the, di- the nuances, the differences in how you yep. install and uninstall. There's also package differences. Like there's certain packages you can get on Debian that in, in, Al- in their package manager you can't get in Alpine and vice versa. It's, um, it's not always one for one. Uh, so this is a really cool way to sort of tip your, dip your toes <laughs> uh, into you know, the various commands and understanding the nuance difference. So you can run this side by side with a CentOS container, for example. Um, and I think a lot of students do that once they, in fact, this is a common question, what's the difference between Ubuntu and a container and Ubuntu VM? And um, what, what, do, John, do you have a good explanation for that? Do you have a... Um, you get, obviously, you get more in a, in a VM um, because Ubuntu is working really hard. You know, Alpine's so popular because it's so small and because it's so, you know, they take out all the fluff. Uh, Ubuntu is working towards that in their Docker containers. So, um, you know, to tr- because people are concerned about disk space. Um, whereas if you have it running in a VM, you get all the bells and whistles. You get, um, you know, you get all the libraries and all the fun, fun stuff that that you don't get for saving space. Um, for example, we saw it just a minute ago. I don't believe the Ubuntu Docker container has man pages. 
um, because they need that space. So yeah. um, that that's the big difference. Um, the other thing I use I use the container for is I use it when I built a few Docker files, and it's good to have the container up for when you're doing your run commands when you're you know adding packages. You can run it in a, its own container and test to make sure that your commands will work, that your the package you're wanting to install actually exists. Um, so that's another another really good use for running an Alpine container and and you know having testing before you put something into a Docker file to make sure it'll work. Yeah, and uh, one of the common questions we get in um in the class, in the uh, courses, it is around like, you know, if I'm trying to be minimal and small in my, um, my containers, why am I installing a full Linux distribution? So people get confused about the uh, distributions in, in containers. So an Ubuntu or an Alpine or a CentOS um, or a Debian or something like that. And they, they're a little bit confused about why they would use that versus this minimal uh, aspect and the way that I answer that for people is that the, the like you said that there there's huge differences between a, a gig sized Ubuntu server install and the hundred meg that you get in an Ubuntu image and right. really for most people uh, for the average container builder like myself I consider myself definitely sort of not doing anything ex extremely special I'm just putting normal apps inside of a container the difference there really is the fact that um, you're you're getting the package managers and the things that are default in that version of the distribution. So if you were to look at like an Ubuntu one, and if I and if I pull latest, I don't know really which version I'm using. But if I were to specify something like um, 1804, and that's the the long term release on this, so that you get sort of a predictable uh, enterprisey version with long term support. And if I do an uh, an apt update and an apt install of something, I'm going to get a different version of that than if I were to use a different version of Ubuntu. So the way that Ubuntu does their package managers is uh, if you installed, for instance, Ubuntu 16.04, an older version, when you install packages with that, you get a, a predictable set of packages that are versioned for that release. And if you do an Ubuntu 18.04, uh, you're going to get different uh, sort of presumably newer packages. And uh, that's the same experience you would have on a host, right, if you just did a full VM. So uh, you're, you're not technically worried about, like, kernel patches or stuff like that when you're dealing with these Ubuntu um, or different distribution images because, again, they don't have the kernel in them. They don't have hardware drivers, stuff like that. But right. um, if you're trying to – what I t normally do for people is I recommend – if you're going to take an old app that you've already had before containers and you need to move it into a container, use the specific version and distro as you're from, and it'll be so yeah. much easier, right? Like, yeah, it'll make life a lot, a lot more pleasant if you do that because, yeah, you have it there. Um, and while you were, while you were doing that, um, Ubuntu's latest tag is on 18.04. Um, since that's a long-term support, uh, if you want 19.04 or soon to be 19.10, you need to specify those those by uh, by version number. Yeah. Um, oops. Apt install curl. I'm I'm abbreviating my I. I'm getting my npm commands <laughs> and my apt commands different. So this yeah. is sort of like 101, right? Like uh, how how would I live inside a Linux uh, container. In fact, a lot of new students will say, okay, now I've installed a bunch of stuff in on the terminal for my Linux uh, stuff here. And if you um, want to keep that, because you're like, okay, I installed some cool stuff, and I'm just playing around with this. I'm not building a Docker file. I'm not deploying an ap application. I'm just playing around with Linux. Most people don't realize, uh, this isn't on our list, but I just realized that this would make sense. Um, that number there is the... Uh, the ID of the container. So if I were, you know, I still have uh, a list of containers that aren't running. Okay, stop it. Um, 
So notice I don't have anything running, but if I do a dash A, or actually a dash L, it would show me the last one, and uh. that was the one I just exited. So now I can't necessarily rename that. That's something, some of the things you can't do with containers is change them uh, a lot when they're, when they're no longer running. But what you can do is you can do other Docker commands like Docker commit. And Docker commit allows you to take what you just did in that unique container and save it to a new image. So I might say something like Docker commit, um, the container ID, and then call it my new Ubuntu. And then if I wanted to run that later, I could start a new container right from that image. I could even do a save or an export and pull that image out. And then, you know, I don't have to use a registry. So there's, there's some, we don't really teach a lot of this in the course because this is not so much the predictable, this isn't really DevOps, right? This is just you right. playing with a tool locally on your machine and learning Linux. Um, so that's you could save this, your own custom things. That's what your weekly YouTube chat's for, <laughs> is learning right. stuff like this. That's right. Uh, this is where we go deep in the random topics. Um, <laughs> so John and I went through and we came up with some sort of other cool things you could do that are maybe kind of Linuxy. Um, obviously, so we've talked about the base distributions. You can play around with those, understand all that stuff. Um, let's uh, talk about some specific commands. So there's two UK use cases where I like to show off sort of the Linux um, abilities in Docker. And one of those is running utilities that you don't have on your local machine. I mean, even if you're on Mac and Windows, you might be able to find a binary. Like if you're on Windows, it's chocolate. You can use a chocolatey installer. And if you're on Mac, you can use Brew. And they can install a lot of U Unix and Linux utilities, but they don't have everything. So, right. um, John, why don't, I, I'm going to pull up the website. Why don't you talk about HTTPing? Okay. Yeah. Um, let me, I'm going to jump over there as well. So, HTTPing is. Um, Let's see. I, I looked at it briefly. I it, uh, it Oh, I'm, I didn't mean, I'm sorry. I'm not HTTP specifically, but like this example of we're running a command line to run a utility. Um, didn't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> uh, that's all right. That's not on my local machine. Um, so I basically what we're doing here is we're just saying, hey, I want to run a utility that I don't have locally, but I'm going to use Docker to do it. Okay, so um, so yeah, I mean, it, as you see up there, you've got the Docker run, and it is a great way to learn a new tool. Um, it, you know, just you can bring it up in a container, and actually, probably um, for people that are new to DevOps that um, come are coming from the development side, it's a great way to learn how to work with uh, Nginx. Um, you can bring up an Nginx container. You can um, you can exec into a Bash shell or Ash shell in the container. Look at the config files, and um, and learn. You know, use that to learn some of the different directives. Um, I'm I'm going to be playing with HTTP in in the very near future because you'll, it you'll does. learn that you're going to learn that in the uh, swarm mastery course <laughs> all right so um, i'll be looking forward to that um and so it it's like it like learning linux itself um you know using containers is a great way to learn some of the uh different services and applications that you find within linux so you know you can you can create your own uh, build your own web server and, and you know learn how learn how some of the different modules work how to how to configure it to do what you need it to do uh, without having to worry about any other website and you can't break anything because it's all local and, and yeah. within your machine. And and again, that's the beauty of Docker is you know you can do the stuff without breaking and anything that matters. Yeah, you can just delete it. it. <laughs> yeah, if if you if you mess something up, okay, I'll just delete it and start over, and it's not a huge deal. You 
you know, if you're doing something that you want to keep, throw in some bind mounts for the configuration directories. Yeah. Um, and a great way to do that is to see how, you know, say, and um, at my last job, we used Jira. And we did an update from Jira 7 to Jira 8. So I took I built a um, a container with Jira seven. I bind mounted all the config you know all the config directories, and then I brought up Jira eight to see what configs I needed to change, what configs broke, uh, any any add ons that broke, and it it was an you know it was a great way to do it before we even started to do it in development or testing. Yeah. Um, Often you can do that by just changing one line, right? Like you change the from of the image to a different version and then spin it back yeah. up. And and, the, and that's exactly what I did. I used the yeah. from, changed it from uh, from 7 to 8. And, and granted, Atlassian doesn't have an official Jira container yet. Um, but one of the, one of their employees, one of their engineers created the, the one we used. Mm. And it, you know, even before you get to working with dev, a, a dev environment, you have an idea of what's of what you're doing. And, um, you know, before Docker, you you'd have to build a whole separate machine. You'd have to install everything separately and then do go through the full upgrade, which, you know, you took a day's work and dropped it into 20 minutes at the most and that's if you're if you're really you know nitpicky about how you're editing yeah uh, so the savings in time alone is is phenomenal yeah and um while you were talking i was showing off uh this http ping command because uh yeah. it's it's sort of a great example and and uh i use it in swarm mastery because it it shows a couple of things we're, we don't actually focus on the tool itself and you know how it works and the fact that I can get this sort of shell GUI from it inside a container um, and it has colors and it's all pretty and everything. But what's happening in the background is Docker is just outputting all of this in the in a, a standard STD out shell experience and I didn't have to install the tool locally. So I think I want to point out here is I always love to highlight different security positives and negatives and the, the positive here is um, running any Linux utility inside of a container means you're not exposing it to your host file system, right? And and so if something is nef like if you're just download, we just downloaded code essentially. I just downloaded code off the internet and ran it on my machine. Now I built that image, so I feel like I at least know a little bit about what it's doing. But we all are used to, you know, in the in the world where we're just downloading everything all the time and running it arbitrarily. Uh, containers also, you have to remember, give us that extra layer of protection. So whenever I'm working with clients or even with students that they have code that want to sort of test, um, I always feel much more comfortable about running that inside a container than having like running it on my local machine and giving it full access to my hard drive. Um, in, in the past, I might have run a separate VM running Linux or Windows or whatever in order for, to run that client's code because I wasn't really sure if I wanted that on my real host machine. But now with right. containers, we, we get that level of abstraction out of the box, so we don't have to sweat it anymore. Yeah, and it, and it, like I said, it takes you you know two or three minutes to spin up a to pull up a container, um, as opposed to the time it takes to build the VM and and have it offhand off to the side. Yeah, and by the way, uh, we got another Docker captain sneaking in in the chat right now. CJ's in there. Um, and he's throwing in, he's throwing in uh, a tip. So, you know, thanks for being on the show. Uh, yeah, and, and he mentions SH, which, um, you know, we're pointing out that Ash exists on Alpine, uh, or Bash doesn't exist on Alpine, whereas it's on, you know, Ubuntu and CentOS. Um, the SH shell uh, is everywhere. Yeah. It, you know, any any uh, Unix Linux derivative will have SH available. It's you know, it's the very basic basic of all basic shells. 
Yeah. Um, so it, it exists everywhere. And while we're on the topic of launching commands in the shell and maybe even having a GUI, um, another good, this is a good segue to the other thing I really like for the command line, focusing on Linuxy things that I'm doing locally on machine inside a container, is running something that was previously complicated on my host machine to get set up and having it just sort of a one-liner run inside my container. And in the past, when we we're talking about development, you know, doing things like Ruby versions or Node versions without having to have a bunch of ep or Python two versus three. Like these are always yeah. challenges on your host machine to make sure you don't break existing environments while you're also trying something new. So obviously that stuff works great in a container, but there are other ways you can use containers as well. One of my favorites is uh, Vim with a bunch of plugins because Vim is notoriously challenging to get all the right plugins to make everything work from your shell. And InVim yeah. is my favorite version of or edition of Vim, and Space Vim is my favorite distribution of Vim. <laughs> so here's a great example. Yeah. Docker run it, and then I'm going to remove the container when I'm done with it. So I can do Space Vim, Space Vim, and then tell it to run InVim, the uh, sort of a different distribution of Vim itself, and Space Vim is a package manager on top of that. And basically, without having to have anything fancy on my machine, I'm getting a pretty fancy version of Vim right out of the box. And of course, nice. you're thinking, well, how do I get files in and out of that? Well, that's not that hard. You can basically do that same command with a volume, right? So you can just specify a volume in there and do your current working directory wherever you're at and then put it some path into the container and then just tell Vim when you're in the container to go get that. So I might do something like um, home space Vim user and source. And then that way, when I'm in the container, uh, oh, let's pick my dark mode. And then I can open up different files on that file system. In fact, you might even say, I don't, I don't want to run Vim directly. I just want to run the SH shell inside that container. Oops. Uh, hmm. Oh, you know what? It's got an entry point. <laughs> so we'd yeah. have to, uh, okay. yeah, we'd have to do, um, I'm spitballing here. Entry point is empty. I think I have to put double quotes on yeah. that. And then that'll uh, stop the entry point. And then I can have I can have my sort of full shell inside the container, and um, see. Oh yeah, where's my where's my source directory? Did I not spell it right? Yeah, there we go. Yeah. So now I'm looking at my local machine, and I can go start pulling up files inside of Vim in there. And uh, I. I perfect my Vim install locally. So this really isn't a great alternative to just having the utilities you need on your local machine if you can get them. But what the big difference here is, what if you got to jump on a server and edit a file? <laughs> like who wants to go manage and install Vim on random servers because they got to <laughs> open up one file? And maybe they don't want to use the, the plain old Vim or whatever that, you know, Emacs or Nano or whatever is on that machine by default. So you can probably do all of this stuff. Um, and oh, we're getting some more tips from Sujay. Throwing in the control P, control Q uh, to get out of container and keep it running in the background. So um, there's always something new to learn. Uh, so while we're on the topic of all this stuff, let's um, let's jump over to some questions. Since we've got some patient people in chat asking <laughs> when to ask questions. So I think this question is for you, John. Um, did you ever build your own Linux distro? No, I have not. Uh, I, I've never needed to at work, and I'm kind of of the point to the point where, you know, I save all the difficult stuff at work when I'm doing stuff at home. I just want it to work. I, I, I don't want to waste my brain cells <laughs> trying to fix something at, at home. Uh, that that I wouldn't necessarily need to at work. So, yeah. um, and also, 
you know, through my career, I've done a lot of contracting and a lot of consulting. So I'm kind of at that. Um, I'm a master of, or jack of all trades, master of few. Right. And so, a good place to uh, be. yeah, I'm, I'm fully happy doing that. So for me, you know, it's not important. There's not, there are a lot of things I can't do off the top of my head. And so while I'm okay with that because I know where to look. And for me, it's important to, you know, that's as important, if not more, is not knowing everything, but knowing where to find everything. And so I just never, you know, felt like taking the time to do, to well, build my own. Yeah. And a distro is a lot of work. I mean, yeah. uh, it's one thing to build a, uh, rebuild a kernel or, to, uh, mm. so I think, um, Anyone who's played around with Linux for a significant amount of time eventually wants to rebuild their own kernel, especially if they're running on their bare metal hardware, because there's usually yeah. a driver they need or something they want to add to the kernel. Um, yep. And I've, I've built a few kernels in my day, <laughs> right. and, they're, right. they're, and they can be really painful to build. So. And, and luckily, they're a lot faster nowadays on modern hardware to build than they were. Oh, yeah. You know, I, 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 you remember Gentoo? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's still around, yeah. but uh, it back, back in the day, I was all about FreeBSD, and then Gentoo was sort of the, sh- the first, in my mind, the first Linux distro to show up that had really good package management built out of the box, yeah. um, and it was sort of paving the way for now what we what we all know is the apps and yums and all the other package managers. Yes. And uh, you did back then. We did a lot of uh, kernel rebuilding because you needed like Wi-Fi drivers and. <laughs> <laughs> various things yeah. to uh, get things to work, right? Video drivers and, yeah. I The first time I ever built a com, uh, kernel, it was on a really, really old box. Even even by the standard of that day, it was really old. And it took like four hours for the kernel to build. And thank God we don't have to do that anymore <laughs> because that, yeah. that was absolutely painful because – you know, you can't really walk away from it because if something breaks, you know, you, you've got to be there. Right. You Otherwise, know, you're starting over later. You can't assume it's going to finish. <laughs> yeah, you you can never assume, it. you know, one thing, my favorite word when somebody's asking me to fix something, it, my favorite reply is, it should work. Because right. you never, you, I don't guarantee anything yeah. when it comes to computers. So, so another yeah. question for you is uh, the way I have to come learn Linux was because of school and work with all the training out there. What is a good learning path to get comfortable in Linux? Uh, there are so many of them. It, it, most of it depends on what angle you're trying to learn it from. For me as a system admin, the way I need to learn it is different than somebody who's a developer. Because I need to know different things. I need to understand configuration files and how they're set up. I really need to understand logging and how logging is configured and and how that's set up. Um, So it hugely depends on what what you're wanting to do. A system administrator is is much much different than a developer and how they approach um, how they approach Linux. Yeah. Um, But the, the key is to, you know, if you don't use it, you lose it. So you've got to keep up with it. You can't, you know, if you learn it for your job now um, and then you leave that job or you finish school, don't just stop because you don't have, you know, you're not doing it anymore. You need to find things to keep doing because if you don't, uh, it's, it's hard to come back to certain things and it'll take you a lot longer. Yeah. So... Um, you know, Udemy has a lot of, a lot of good courses. Uh, I'm, I'm a pretty big fan of Udemy. I, you know, wait till courses go on sale for 10 bucks and then I'll buy a course that I think I might need in the future because, Hey, it's only 10 bucks. Um, probably one of the easiest ways to get started, especially if you're someone who learns the different modalities, like you, you need exercises, but you also like to watch and, you're not, some, mm-hmm. you're, you're not just wanting to read a bunch of blog entries on random topics and you want a sort of a themed approach, which is why I do what I do for Docker. Because if I had to learn Linux uh, from scratch, uh, I would, you're right, I would probably buy a course. Um, or, you know, the thing about Linux right now is there are lots of free courses. 
Um, and I'm, and yeah. I'm not saying they're better than the paid courses. You kind of a lot of times you get what you pay for. But there's a lot <laughs> oh, yeah. of great getting started courses out there that are almost free or completely free. That I probably yeah. would recommend to a new person. I'd say if you like you're saying if you depending on how you learn and depending on the problems that you have now, right? So like someone who's learning Linux because they bought a Raspberry Pi and they don't know anything about Linux, but they now have this little Linux box essentially that um, Raspberry Pi 4 is out. Uh, yes, I can't <laughs> uh, wait. I, I, I keep one. Uh, I'm, I'm going to have to wait a while to buy it because I don't have time to play with it right now. But uh, um, my uh, I have not. It's on my Christmas Christmas wish list basically <laughs> to get a, to get yeah. it for. I'm excited about the speed improvements uh, so the, they can be closer the, and closer to a desktop. Speed and memory options. You can get the, I mean, for just 20 bucks more, you can quadruple the memory. And yeah. that's that's what I'm looking forward to. I I currently am using Pi-hole for, uh, for ad blocking. And I, I want to add things other than just ads. But every time you add to what it's going to block, you know that's taking up memory. Yeah. So having a, you know having the four gig size, then I can go. Um, Dan's Guardian is a really good um, blocking tool, and they have all kinds of lists. They've got lists of uh, of gambling sites and you know smoking sites, and you know they break it down by different subjects, and you can get a whole list of sites to block from that and yeah. start adding those in and block them out but you know with the one gig pie you got to watch what you're doing or you'll start yeah. having so yeah i can't wait for i can't wait for that minimum yeah uh, minimum uh thin applications you definitely have to worry about the ram there the next question yeah. i got up for you is we're going to do some rapid fire here how to learn all the build tools needed to compile the app i don't know if this is a separate question i think it's a separate question uh Specifically, don't uh, don't knowledge a lot of programming, a lot of programming language to compile the source. Hmm. I I I don't think it's a good idea to learn all of them. You know, pick a language, and and work on that. Um, you know, the best the best way to do that is start looking on job sites, see what languages people are looking for in developers and then start go and go from there if you try to you know if you being a jack of all trades is really good as in, in operations because you have so many things to come that come up and the experiences help i don't think so much that works for programming because you know your company will want you to focus on one language and one language only yeah. or one or two languages. So um, look and see what people, what people are calling for in the dev space and, and see what, and go from there. Um, you know, Java, for example, if, so, if, if you want to learn Java, download, you know, the open JDK and start working from there. Um, Python, whatever, whatever it is that you want to do, start looking at that. But don't try to look. Don't try to be everything. It, it in the in the dev world, I don't think that works as well. Yeah, yeah. The only thing that might be universal, or at least semi-universal, might be the uh, the make and make files. Like um, yeah, uh, there's and and then obviously package managers, right? AP, uh, APK, um, apt, yum. Uh, right. Understanding the package managers, how you get packages down, how you pick specific versions of packages, how you pin those versions so they don't accidentally get upgraded. Uh, I would say that's um, uh, just as important as knowing the build tools because the, usually the build tools have dependencies on things that have to be installed, libraries, and you get those through package managers. So it's almost like learn the fundamentals of just getting around the OS and managing a computer, then learn the package managers to get the right tools installed, then maybe learn something like uh, Make just because it's sort of a universal wrapper around all sorts of other tools. And then, yeah. then like John's saying, like you have to pick a language and get specific into those build tools for that language, and they're all different, right? Yeah. So yeah, it's... I think I think being good, like John mentioned earlier, uh, Matt, uh, was it? Um, you, have, you have a lot of knowledge, a lot of general knowledge on, on, on stuff, but you only know deep knowledge on a specific few things, and that's what really helps you be diverse. You can't learn... You can't be the expert in build tools for every single language out there. 
Uh, people that have been doing this for 20 years probably aren't that. So, <laughs> no. so why even attempt that? Just focus on, you know, like either what the job you're, you have or the job you're going after. Focus on those for now. And over time, I think you'll probably get experience. Like, you know, John, I'll be honest. Um, I don't have a lot of interest in, you know, building Java apps myself. But if I ended no. up with a job or a client where they were using Java, suddenly my interest gets peaked because they expect me to know something. They're like, we need to build this tool. Can you help us? And then my interest gets peaked because I'm working in a team that's using it. Suddenly I care more then I learn more. Um, just learning things for the sake of learning sometimes over time will be will become dull because you're just learning for the sake of learning. And sometimes you just need a real reason to learn something. So yeah, and that, wait for the that's job. That's how I learn. You know, I, I can't just randomly learn something. I need to have a purpose. And, you know, I, I need to have some specific goal in mind to learn this, you know, like Docker. I, Docker, I enjoy. I think it's a great technology and, and I'm enjoying learning it and it helps me in my job and it helps me personally because I, I help people, you know, get websites up and running. I don't, I don't code them, but I get them get them going so <laughs> yeah 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 next question rapid fire have you ever built your own car no he, he's talking about he's that's oh Charlie's oh sorry to, i didn't even yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry that, i misread reply. the question yes he's replying to the previous question have you ever built your own car it's similar to building your own distro excellent thanks charlie i yep. i i spaced right over the name there um uh let's see the fact that I can test in a pure Docker is really mind blowing. Uh, I think we have some comments here, and then actually questions. We'd love to see more distros being Dockerized when learning Linux or a new distro file system structure and our package manager is huge time saver as well and can start directly with a shell. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and we, we don't all have to use distros. Um, technically, though, if you're using any of the f official images by default, like if you're just downloading. MySQL or Nginx or whatever, those are all on a very minimal version of Debian. So uh, just if you, in case you wanted to learn a distro that is going to be more commonly used in containers than anything else, right now it's going to be Debian. So you might want to just check that one out, which is a sort of, it's similar but different than Ubuntu. It's a sort of a variant or an upstream of Ubuntu a little bit. Yeah, Ubuntu, Ubuntu is based on Debian. So the, the core of Ubuntu is Debian. And and basically, all Linux distros, they're all based on, um, built on the Linux kernel. And it's just, you know, how they, how that particular company sees their, you know, Linux to be. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, here's a great question. Uh, what are some th important things to consider when preparing to Dockerize a JavaScript application built on a Ubuntu 16 VM? So uh, this is sort of the lift and shift, or as Docker likes to call it, uh, migrating traditional apps (MTA), um, where a lot. I mean, a lot of stuff we're, we're going to run in containers is not uh, greenfield. It's not brand new code. It's code that's already existing, and we've got to make it work inside a container. Um, John, have you had to do anything like that? Have you had, had you, have you had to yet make old apps fit and work in a container yet? I um, one of my first, and I I don't count it as a lot uh, as far as experience is concerned. But my first actual touching of Docker, um, the company I worked for, they had a, a Tomcat instance with like forty three applets running on this Tomcat in, yeah. uh, applet. And I had to restart Tomcat, and this was in an, on an AWS EC2 instance, and it was a demo machine. So of the forty some odd applets, only maybe ten were running at any one given time. They shut down the other applets. Well, you can imagine how absolutely painful 43 java applets starting <laughs> at the same time would be yep. and it just it, it was it was horrible it was the worst thing ever um so what i ended up doing is i worked with the sales guys and the developers um which were the ones that used them and i took all the applets that nobody really used 
put them in a single container and then the applets that would come and go, I gave them their own container. And so, you know, I had a base knowledge of Tomcat going into that, but it, you know, what you, what you need to learn is what the application, what files the application needs and for itself, not, you know, in the in this case, I needed to have all the applet files um, separated, yeah, and then put them in, you know, put them on the bind. They were all bind mounted, and um, and so you need to understand how your how your application works with the OS. What things are needed? Um, you want to start, and you want to Dockerize it in. Um, you want to put it into an Ubuntu sixteen oh four container to start. You don't want to go up to eighteen yet. So throw it into a, a, a six uh, an Ubuntu sixteen oh four container, and just start tweaking things here and there until you know you have everything you need up and running. Um, and then once you've done that. You know, obviously, if you're going to upgrade to eighteen oh four, then you start worrying about the upgrade. You take, you know, all your bind mounted files, create, it, copy them over, create a new container running eighteen, and start troubleshooting from there. Yeah. But the That's most important advice. thing is understanding what what requirements your application has, what files it needs, what libraries, what. And and not just JavaScript, but any application that you're containerizing, you need to you need to understand what that application needs to run, and find a way to put those into your um, into your Docker container. Yeah, and I and I think for me the general workflow of doing all that is if I have so let's say in this case you have a you have a VM, you have an app on it, and let's say worst case scenario you didn't install it. You don't have documentation on what was installed. The bash history file isn't there, so you can't tell how the server was installed. <laughs> you have no documentation on what it was installed. Like, let's just assume worst case. For me, I would typically uh, copy out everything I think I need for that app, like find out where the actual applications are running. Maybe systemd is running that for you. And I'm going to copy those files out, and then I'm going to put those in a container image. Just, I'm just going to do a simple sort of from Ubuntu, in this case, Ubuntu 16, copy those files in, and then nothing else. And then I'm going to shell into the container on my machine, and I want to spend time there doing apt get package installs, you know, doing changing configurations, tr and then just doing the command that runs that app. So if it's a JavaScript app, maybe you're talking about Node, and I'm just going to run Node to try to get that app working on my local machine. And I'm act interactively in a container. I, don't go bother like guessing with a Docker file and then rebuilding and then trying and it fails and then go back and change the Docker file again and rebuild and it fails. Like don't do all that. That's a, a lot of repetitive work. Spend the time in the container itself just doing kind of what a, like a Linux sysadmin would do is just sitting at the terminal trying to bang out commands to make something run. Once you get yeah. it working, you can then take – hopefully you remembered what some of the things you did <laughs> – and you can yeah, take document the hell out of it. Right. Docu document what works, right? Every command you run, you, even if it doesn't work, document document the command and document whether it worked or not. Yeah. And then you've got your notes and then you can go back through and create your Docker yeah. file. And you yeah, so that way you that's so you, that at that point that's when you go to the Docker file, right? And you can even yeah. run those side by side so that You've got your interactive shell that you're running things in, and then you've got your Docker file that you're building, and you're running it in two different containers on two different ports. I would go that route. So if you think of a strategy of how to sort of force an old app into a container that you have zero evidence. That, like, basically, I've run into situations, especially PHPs and like Java. Like they, they've been, those are languages that have been around a long time. So I often run to, to PHP apps that are running in the cloud. People are – these are interactive – apps that are web-based that are being used every day and they now want to put it in a container but they're not exactly sure how it got built <laughs> maybe it's a small company or they had a, a contractor build it for them and they the contractor didn't document their install or whatever and so no, that never yeah. happens <laughs> that never happens they were nah. trying to save money yeah. uh so that that is sort of like forensic sysadmin stuff right so you have to sort of figure out uh the pro tip there is to go look at the bash history 
to see, uh, assuming that they logged in as root or whatever user they logged in as, look at the bash <laughs> histories because you can go back. You Often those files are there since the inception of the server and you can go back and see every command typed and figure out how that server was built and then just sort of repeat those commands in a Docker file. So Yeah, and... and you know, and even if you do know, even if you have that information, you still want to start, you know, with a with a core OS v, uh, container and build from there and take notes because you know those will happen as a you know yeah you're you'll still run you'll potentially run into issues because you're dealing with a much more minimized uh, OS so to speak in your container so. Um, whether or not you know what how it was built, you need to you need to take the time, build it from an OS, you know, build it from the the core container, and then build your then once you have it up and running, take your notes and build your Docker file. Yeah. All right. So we are at an hour for the show, but I did want to leave you empty handed with a bunch of other examples. So we're going to rapid fire a bunch of examples that we had written down of other things you can try. One of the big ones you've heard about on this show before is uh, NetShoot, which is uh, made by one of the Docker team members, Nikolai. Uh, he created basically, oh, wrong window, wrong window. Okay, this one. So uh, we'll put up the link in chat and this one, oh, that's the wrong window too. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Safari. There's this is what we want. There we go. Um, so this is basically, and I've seen this before, that one of the great things in containers is that if you need to troubleshoot a system, you don't have to install stuff on the host, right? If you have a Linux server in the cloud and it's running Docker, just you basically you're going to pull down your, your troubleshooting utilities in a container and run them that way. And he has a really great repo that I've also forked and stole from him. <laughs> on a whole bunch of network troubleshooting tools. And really, a majority of these tools are just Linux troubleshooting tools. And there's so many examples in here that we can't possibly go through them all. But I will just highlight a few. Um, he gets sort of the namespace stuff out of the way because that's one of the things in containers that if you're trying to troubleshoot a host and you're doing stuff from in a container, you have to care about things like namespaces because those will limit or affect your ability to troubleshoot. So he explains a little bit of that. But... He uses a chart that um, is from someone else that shows sort of what you would do in terms of observing different parts of the Linux subsystems with different tools. So all the little colored boxes are the parts, the conceptual parts of a Linux system. And the black little um, words here, or acronyms or abbreviations or whatever you want to call them, those are the binary tools that you would run uh, to look and inspect that part of the system. And there's a lot here. So obviously no one person is going to be a guru at all these things unless you're, you know, working on the Linux kernel all day. But this it gives a good example of how you might look at some all these. This is the tools list that's installed here. And if you scroll down, you eventually get to some examples about specific tools like IP, iPerf, um, TCP dump, which is... Uh, I mean, come on, you, you got to some, at some point, if you're going to play around with Linux, you got to run some T TCP dump and look at all those frames coming in your computer and realize that we don't know what, what really what's going on in this computer. <laughs> well, <It's>, yeah, <laughs> because it's going to fly by you. But um, NetStat is a really great one for understanding your IPs and ports and connections that are coming in and out of your networking. Uh, InMap is something that I love running when I want to look at another computer and see what I can see from it remotely, like what ports it has open. Be careful with that one. It can be used for good and for bad. We only use it for good. And never run and never run it against like AWS. If you run it against AWS, they will flag you. They'll they'll catch you for it. And always have permission of right. the site's owner before you run it because Nmap that's something that is almost always run before an attack. So yeah. as soon as somebody notices an Nmap scan being run, it, it raises red flags, it gets people's hackles up, and you got to be careful. It's kind of like someone walking, like if you're running this against someone else's server without their permission, it's like someone walking up to your physical house and checking that all your doors and windows are locked. Mm -hmm. like, like maybe they weren't trying to get in your house, but you don't know that. You just know they were looking at all the entry points. <laughs> 
Yeah. And and I did this very on early in my career, in my like maybe <laughs> like year seven, which I consider early at this point. Uh, yeah. And I had a new job at a very big company with a dedicated security team, and I had some new servers I had to take care of that I didn't know anything about. So I in mapped them. And then I immediately got a security person standing next to my desk going, one, you're not uh, even allowed to have that tool here, which I thought was silly. Uh, and yeah. two, you, before you start running that on our network, you need to let us know. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a good way to get to know your security people. But it's um, also and, a great learning tool. So I don't yes. want to leave it out, right? Like it's a great tool. Use it for good oh, on your own system. Yeah. And, and if you go back up Netstat, uh, anyone who – who uh, has fun with uh, with the tech support scammers? Mm. They'll run Netstat on on your win- on the Windows machine and say, "See all these foreign addresses? These are people hacking your computer." Yeah, um, that's, right. That's one of my side side joys. Is is uh, they call it scam baiting. So I will yeah. I will take those calls and I'll have fun with those people. Oh, I just watched one of those the other day, the day on YouTube about a guy that was sort of uh, inspecting a he had an internal access to a scam uh, a scam shop essentially, and it was fascinating yep. to learn how they uh, you know do social engineering essentially to convince people to give them control of their computers, and it, it's both, oh, yeah. both scary and fascinating all at the same time. It is, and and some of the stuff they do is. You know, the people you're talking to are just reading the script, but the people who got them to the point where they could read, you know, who wrote the script, some of the stuff they can do is pretty scary. Yeah. Yeah. And back to these tool, this tool list, Netcat yeah. is another really great one. Um, we got some questions about uh, troubleshooting networks from specified Docker Swarm services. Uh, basically, I would say how to... Um, how to do that is to go through all these tools in this repo and learn them. Netcat is a great way to see traffic going from one container to another. And it, you're not going to do this in an hour, right? This is this is stuff that's going to take you days or weeks to get good at uh, understanding all these tools, understanding packets and networking and virtual, IP, virtual uh, interfaces and all that stuff. It's a lot to take in if you're not someone new. But this is one of the best ways to get started. Um, Obviously, it, we talk a little bit more about some of these basics inside my Swarm Mastery course, but we really cover them very, very basic. Uh, it's definitely not a Linux troubleshooting course um, by any means. So check out this stuff. The other two things we wanted to throw out to you before uh, we get out of here is that you can actually run a bash container. <laughs> so in case you're someone who's really into shells and you want to run a specific version of a specific shell, th- there is an official container for bash. Um, ZSH and other um, shells have their own as well, but Bash obviously is one of the most popular. It's out of the box. If you're someone who likes to experiment with going a little bit uh, out of the norm, there's Fish, which uh, I'm a ZSH fan, but there's people that love Fish as their shell. And they're, uh, just like there's Oh My ZSH, which is a package manager on top of the, the ZSH shell, there is Oh My Fish, which is a package manager on top of the Fish shell. And it gives, it gives you all sorts of quick little ways to move around your file system to access things with less typing, essentially, and then lots of built-in little utilities that just make it easier managing a shell. And you can run all of these. They give you examples on how to run those here on the website. But you can, you can basically experiment with other shells rather than you know, what we all have to used to do is either download the shell to your machine and, and then run that shell yourself which maybe you don't really want to do that, or you have to build a VM for that. It, this is just a sort of easy way to play with different shells. Um, yeah, yep. and we want to throw these out there. I've never actually run Oh My, My Fish until just before this show because I wanted to check it out, um, and it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. It's not, it's not going to make me hop off of ZSH yet, but uh, <laughs> especially now that, by the way, the next version of macOS is going to have ZSH by default out of the box as the new, as the new default shell, so... Ah. I'm I'm pretty excited about that. That something that the speculation is it's about licensing at the end of the day, because uh, Bash is GPL and I think yes. VSH is like Apache or MIT or something. Um, anyway, licensing, uh, and you know Apple loves to not use stuff that they're forced to re-give away or anything like that. So yeah, they're they're they like to hide what they do. Right. 
Yes, which is why we all are talking about Linux right now and not Mac OS. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So, uh, well, you know, this has been there's been a lot covered here. We have answered a lot of questions. Um, think, uh, yeah, and, and John thrown up this comment that make files the best part, place to start. Uh, definitely want to um, reiterate that there are some common there's some common patterns there. But once you get into a specific application, you're going to have specific stuff related to that. Um, but it's been a great show, John. Thank you so much for being on the show. I'm sure we're going to have you on again someday to talk more Linux stuff. Uh, Anytime. Yeah, and remember, John uh, runs the Linux group in Northern Virginia, so if you live anywhere on the East Coast and you're going to be in the D.C. area sometime, look up their meetup. Go to go high-five John at the meetup the next time that they have one. Give uh, Say thank yeah. to him. Buy him a coffee for running a meetup because it's a thankless job. It's a lot of work. Uh, it is. And, and our meetings are the second Saturday of every month uh, at the Northern Virginia Chamber of Commerce building in Tyson. Cool. So. I love the idea of Saturdays. That's a great idea for <laughs> a fun user group like that. Yeah, and, and and we do have fun. We we enjoy it. And like I said, check out the the YouTube channel or look up our YouTube channel. I'm not sure which is the old and which is the new, to be honest. <laughs> but um, Google will well, help. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Google helps, and, and look at them both, and you can tell by the age of the videos. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks one. again, John. It's been great having you on and learning more about uh, Linux and learning Linux inside of Docker. For those of you on the show watching live, thank you so much for here. Thank you for your questions. We will be back here next Thursday with, uh, not unfortunately, without John, but with someone else that uh, next, we, we'll talk about. Next Thursday is the 4th of July. And we're going to have a special 4th of July show. Because we are ah. an international audience. <laughs> I, I will definitely be here, though. <laughs> so uh, thanks for the reminder, though. My wife had to remind me this week. Uh, that's 4th of July. I'm like, let's do it anyway. <laughs> and then we'll go to the picnic. There uh, you go. Yeah. So thank you so much for showing up. And we'll see you next week on DevOps and Docker Live. Ciao. Bye.